All right, so we'll go ahead and get started. This meeting is being recorded, so if people um, who aren't here that have registered, they can get see the video afterwards. Um, so hello, everyone. Um, I'm Maddie Dix. I am the alumni coordinator for the School of Nursing. We are so excited that you were able to join us um, as we kick off the School of Nursing's Hubs Research Series. Um, as all of you already know, the school um, has an abundance of research programs um, that are aimed at advancing nursing research and um, nursing science and practice. Um, we're ranked sixth um, in NI NIH research funding among schools of nursing, which is amazing. Um, within these programs, the school is home to five research hubs, um, which provide funding opportunities to foster collaborative research programs. Um, they feature faculty members and students with similar research interests, um, pursuing pilot projects on similar topics or themes or integrating multiple existing programs that they've already created. Um, today we are starting off our Hubs research series with sleep and circadian rhythms. Um, I am excited to welcome Dr. Faith Lester, uh, whose research focuses on sleep disorders and the impact on health outcomes in patients with chronic medical conditions, which I'm super fascinated because I love sleep. Sleep's my favorite. Um, she has investigated sleep disturbances and chronic conditions such as type 2 diabetes, obstructive sleep apnea, and asthma. If you have any questions during the presentation, there's a little um, chat function at the bottom of your screen um, for Q&A. Um, so you can enter any of your questions in there um, and I will facilitate after um, the presentation is over. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to stop sharing my screen and let uh, you share your Dr. Lessers. Okay. Thank you, Maddie, and good morning, everyone. Let's see if I can, there we go. Okay, so I'm um, going to share um, some information about the sleep and uh, chronobiology hub um, at the School of Nursing, um, focusing um, mainly on um, providing you some, with you with some information about the research that is being conducted by the um, faculty uh, members of the hub. So our hub actually started as a um, small group of faculty in the School of Nursing, including myself, who were interested in sleep um, and created this uh, sleep scholarship group where we were supporting each other as we um, engaged in our uh, sleep-related research. In February 2018, the sleep hub was established in the School of Nursing. And I just wanna highlight some um, activities that we had done um, since that uh, establishment. Uh, so we offered um, pilot funding for one year to um, a school of nursing faculty member who was interested in incorporating sleep in their research. And the award um, was for $5,000. Now later on, I will um, highlight um, that faculty member who is a member of the Sleep Hub and also received that pilot funding. In March and April of 2018, we had a speaker series as part of the University of Pittsburgh's um, Year of Healthy You initiative. We had uh, Dr. Daniel Bicey, who is Professor of Psychiatry and Clinical and Translational Science here at the University of Pittsburgh as one of our speakers. Um, the title of his talk was, Can You Sleep Your Way to Better Health? And we also had the pleasure of having Ann Rogers, who is a professor of the School of Nursing at Emory University, um, be our other speaker in the series. Um, her uh, presentation was entitled Sleeping on the Job, Fatigue and Safety. So the Sleep Hub um, has expanded its membership beyond um, those of us who started the Sleep Scholarship Group. Um, as you'll see, we now have um, other faculty members within the School of Nursing, along with um, students who are working um, with us on uh, sleep-related projects of their own and, and also helping us out with our own research studies. Um, the Hub members have, as you'll see, collaborated on um, book chapters, multiple publications, and also presentations. 
So we know that sleep is a basic human need and that it occupies a third of our lives. So it's, it's not an insignificant thing that is happening. However, there was a time when it was thought that sleep was a passive event, that when we were sleeping, nothing was really happening. Or we were sort of turned off and that it, that it did not affect health outcomes. Um, however, we know more recently, and because of a large and growing body of evidence that that is in fact not true, that um, adequate sleep duration and sleep quality is really essential for promotion of health and well-being. Um, so as you'll see when I um, talk about some key findings from um, myself and from uh, uh, the other faculty uh, hub members, you'll see that short and both long sleep duration along with poor quality of sleep can impact um, both physical and mental health. So as a general overview of, of what the hub members research entails, we're really interested in examining the effect of impaired sleep and or circadian rhythms across a wide variety of populations and topics. So these include children, adults with acute and chronic uh, health conditions, shift workers, caregivers, genetics, and health promotion to reduce cardiovascular risk. So now I'm going to transition into talking about, um, like I said, each of the primary faculty hub, uh, sleep hub members, um, highlighting our uh, research interests, our uh, research funding, current projects, um, publications, and some of the key findings um, from our work. So I am a co-director of the Sleep Hub and assistant professor in the Department of Health and Community Systems um, here at the School of Nursing. So as Maddie had mentioned, my research interest is in uh, comorbid sleep disorders and their impact um, in treatment on health outcomes in patients with chronic medical conditions. My research is primary primarily focused on chronic respiratory diseases, such as obstructive sleep apnea, asthma, and um, COPD. So I have used a wide variety of assessments um, for sleep in my research. Um, I've in, I have done both um, subjective and objective assessments um, of, of subjective assessments, including the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index, the Insomnia Severity Index, Epworth Sleepiness Scale, looking at excessive daytime sleepiness, and also having individuals fill out um, daily sleep diaries. When it comes to objective assessments, I have used actigraphy. And as you can see here in this um, picture, these are examples of um, <clears throat> uh, the Acti watches that we use. So these um, devices monitor movement and allow us to look at sleep and wake patterns. I've also used in-home sleep apnea testing for identification of um, potential sleep apnea diagnosis in my patients. And finally, I've also used qualitative interviews in my research to um, more fully understand individuals' experiences um, with their sleep and also um, sleep-related treatments. So my past and current um, research funding has included um, multiple grants from the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. I had a K-23, which is a career development grant. I had an RO3, which is a um, sort of a pilot study uh, award. And I currently have an RO1, which is a um, in, uh, investigator, uh, initiated, initiated um, award. I also have had funding from Inspire Medical Systems Incorporated. Um, I was also a co-investigator on a career development grant funded by the um, VA Healthcare Network, uh, Vision 4. And most recently, um, I got a, my uh, grant was awarded funding um, through the VA Merit Award Program. Um, so this study will look at um, 
internet-based cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia in veterans with COPD and insomnia undergoing pulmonary rehabilitation. So these are a couple of the current projects that I have um, going on. So as I said, I have an R01 study um, that is <clears throat> entitled Improving Asthma Control Using Internet-Based Cognitive Behavioral Treatment for Insomnia. So the purpose of this study is to compare the efficacy of an internet-based um, CBTI <clears throat> versus basic sleep education on sleep and asthma control in adults with asthma and comorbid insomnia. I also have, um, as I mentioned, a study that was funded by the INSPIRE um, uh, Medical Systems Incorporated. Um, so this is a study is entitled Upper Airway Stimulation Therapy for Sleep Apnea, the Patient's Experience. So with this study, this is actually a qualitative study that we are doing um, individual interviews with individuals to understand factors, <clears throat> um, both facilitators and barriers to the use of upper airway stimulation for the treatment of obstructive sleep apnea. <clears throat> so these are some selected publications of mine in the past two to three years. Um, and this little um, swirly uh, uh, bullet indicates publications where there were multiple hub members as co-authors. And as you can see, I've had, um, I've been, uh, had multiple publications that included one or more um, sleep hub um, members as a co-author. So I just wanted to highlight some key findings from my work. Um, so um, this was uh, findings from a recent uh, publication that I had. Um, so compared with adults with asthma in normal sleep duration, those having short sleep duration were found to experience more frequent asthma attacks, increased healthcare use, and worse health-related quality of life, whereas those individuals with long sleep duration were found to experience more frequent activity limitations. So this next finding is actually from the RO3 study, pilot study that I had referenced previously. Um, this was sort of a, um, a study that gave me um, pilot data um, for the RO1 that I currently have. So um, the results from that RO3 pilot study showed that internet-based CBTI was feasible and potentially eff um, efficacious in adults with asthma and comorbid insomnia. And we found that the internet-based CBTI um, did in fact improve insomnia and asthma control and quality of life in these individuals. Um, Another uh, recent finding from um, a publication from this earlier this year um, was in individuals with COPD and we found that um, disease severity, um, so severity of COPD was found to predict future sleep disturbance. So the greater the sleep dis um, disease severity, the more likely individuals were um, to have sleep disturbances in the future. So next I want to um, uh, highlight some work by Dr. Eileen Chasens, who is uh, the director of the Sleep Hub. She's also a professor and department chair of the Department of Health and Community Systems. So Dr. Chasen's work is interested in the effect of sleep disorders and daytime sleepiness on management of chronic disease. And her disease of interest has been type two diabetes. Dr. Chasens has also used both subjective and objective assessments of sleep in her research. Um, she's used many of the same subjective questionnaires that I have, but she also um, has used the functional outcomes of sleep questionnaire, which is looking at um, limitations in daily function due to impaired sleep. Um, and as for her objective assessment, she's also used actigraphy and in-home sleep apnea testing, but she's also used polysomnography or in-laboratory sleep studies as part of her research. 
Dr. Chasen's has had funding from um, the National Institute of Diabetes and Di Digestive Disorders and Kidney Disease, or NIDDK. Um, that was an R01 study. Oops, sorry. Um, she also had um, uh, recently funding for a K24 mid-career um, grant from uh, National Institute of Nursing Research. And she also previously had had an R21 um, funded by the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. Dr. Chasen's current project is her R01 that I mentioned before, funded by NIDDK. Um, the uh, title is The Effect of Treatment of uh, Obstructive Sleep Apnea on Diabetes Self-Management and Glycemic Control. So the purpose of this study was to determine if continuous positive airway pressure therapy, or CPAP, is superior to sham CPAP for improving glycemic control in persons with type 2 diabetes and obstructive sleep apnea. She also will be examining the association of adherence to active um, CPAP to um, glycemic control after 6 and 12 weeks of treatment. Um, as you can see, these are some selected publications from Dr. Chasen's in the past two to three years. She has also been highly um, collaborative with other um, Sleep Hub members. So some key findings from Dr. Chasen's work I wanna highlight. So she has found that older adults with type two diabetes and comorbid in, uh, sleep apnea and insomnia had better mood, lower uh, diabetes-related distress, and higher uh, levels of daytime function compared to younger adults. She has also found in her work that increased insomnia severity was associated with impaired mood and higher levels of diabetes-related distress and lower functional outcomes in activities sensitive to impaired sleep. She's also shown that smoking is prevalent among persons with um, type 2 diabetes and self-reported sleep problems, and has shown that smoking is an independent predictor of elevated HbA1c in these individuals. Finally, Dr. Chasens has also shown that lower levels of CPAP use is associated with lower HbA1c in persons with type 2 diabetes and obstructive sleep apnea. So next, I want to highlight uh, work from Dr. Christopher Imes, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Acute and Tertiary Care um, here in the School of Nursing. Dr. Imes' research um, interests include the role of sleep and other lifestyle behaviors, such as diet and physical activity, on cardiometabolic disease risk. He's also interested in the role of sleep and other lifestyle behaviors on the health and well being of shift workers. He's also interested in the role of sleep and physical activity on recovery and functioning among lung transplant, lung transplant recipients. And finally, he's also interested in the genetics of sleep and sleep related outcomes. Dr. Imes has used, uh, um, as many of us, both subjective and objective assessments for his um, research. He's used um, accelerometry, so he's meaning he has used um, uh, the ACTI watches that I, I noted before, um, but he's also used these consumer grade devices such as Fitbits um, to monitor um, sleep and also physical activity. Dr. Imes has had um, funding from Sigma Theta Tau International, from the University of Pittsburgh School of Nursing um, Center for Research and Evaluation, or CRE, pilot funding, and also funding from the University of Pittsburgh Healthy Lifestyle Institute. So Dr. Imes has a couple of current projects underway. Um, the first one is um, funded by the uh, Pitt Healthy Lifestyle Institute and is entitled Real-Time Monitoring and Lifestyle Behaviors in Healthcare Providers Engaged in Shift Work, a Pilot Feasibility Study. 
So with this study, he will be examining the feasibility of using a smartphone based application to collect real time um, data on sleep and alertness, physical activity and diet among nurses engaged in shift work. He has another project um, in, that is entitled Nurses Perceptions of Shift Work. And with this project, he is um, examining the benefits and challenges of shift work to identify potential interventions aimed to improve the health and well being of nurses engaged in night and rotating shifts. So these are some selected publications of Dr. Imes in the past two and two to three years. As you can see, he has also been very highly collaborative with um, other Sleep Hub members. So as for some key findings from Dr. Imes' work, um, he has found that among um, mid-aged adults that non-restorative sleep was associated with decreased work performance, such as trouble organizing work, having to do work over due to mistakes and lower productivity. It's also shown that non-restorative sleep and short sleep duration were significantly associated with lower self-rated health. Among uh, nurses engaged in rotating shifts, he has found that sleep disturbances and sleep-related impairment, fatigue, emotional distress, and cognitive abilities were worse after working night shifts compared to after working day shifts. He's also shown that uh, correlates of endothelial function in older adults with untreated sleep apnea and cardiovascular disease risk factors may be different than the correlates in mid uh, middle-aged adults with the same conditions. And finally, he's also shown in his work that behaviorally induced weight loss in overweight and obese adults was associated with reductions in sleep apnea severity. However, the presence of sleep apnea was associated with blunted weight loss, potentially due to reduced adherence to behavior supporting weight loss. So next, I want to highlight work from Dr. Donna Morris, who is a somewhat new, I guess she's been here for uh, an assistant professor for a year now, um, in the Department of Health and Community Systems. So Dr. Morris's research interest um, includes sleep differences in obstructive sleep apnea symptomatology and CPAP adherence. Um, the influence of sleep and gender in sleep and sleep research, and also social determinants of health and healthcare disparities. As you can see, uh, Dr. Morris has used many of the same um, subjective um, assessments of sleep that, that many of uh, us have also used. And she's also used qualitative interviews um, as part of her research. Dr. Morris has um, received funding from the University of Pittsburgh Central Development Research Fund. She also had a National Institute of Health um, F31, um, which is a pre-doctoral um, award. She's also had um, funding from the uh, University of Pittsburgh School of Nursing Margaret E. Wilkes Scholarship Fund Award. And she also had um, funding as a for a postdoctoral um, fellowship or T32 and translational research training in sleep medicine um, here at the University of Pittsburgh. Dr. Mar Morris's uh, current uh, project, which is funded by the University of Pittsburgh Central Development Research Fund, is entitled Sex Differences in Symptom Reports of Obstructive Sleep Apnea. So she will be conducting interviews um, qualitative interviews with men and women recently diagnosed with sleep apnea to gain an understanding of their experiences and symptomatology. So as you can see, Dr. Morris has um, been highly collaborative in publishing with other Sleep Hub members um, in the past two to three years. So to highlight some key findings from Dr. Morris's work, um, she has shown that women and men may report different symptoms of obstructive sleep apnea. 
and that women may report more disturbed sleep and a greater bedtime burden of sleeping, a daytime burden of sleepiness and fatigue than men. He's also shown that sex um, does not moderate the relationship between um, apnea hypopnea index, which is an indicator of the severity of sleep apnea and sleep quality, daytime sleepiness, mood, and daytime function. It's also shown that subjective and objective financial hardship has a greater impact on sleep quality than type two diabetes and obstructive sleep apnea disease severity in patients with type two diabetes and obstructive sleep apnea. And finally, she's also shown Researchers are at a higher risk for attributing their findings to biological sex differences, when instead they may be more appropriately attributed to the influence and expectations of gender. Another faculty member I want to highlight is Christine Feely, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Health Promotion and Development here at the School of Nursing. Dr. Feely is our um, pediatric sleep researcher. Um, she is interested in the sleep in children with a chronic illness, um, in particular those with type 1 diabetes, um, interested in sleep in their parental caregivers, and sleep in the dyad of the parent and child with a chronic illness. She's also interested in how technology use impacts sleep in parents and children. And finally, she's interested in how sleep in the dyad of parent and child with a chronic illness may influence stress, self-management, depressive symptoms, and anxiety. So Dr. Feely has used um, many um, subjective assessments, um, particularly ones um, that are geared towards pediatric populations or um, questionnaires in which a parent is answering for the child. And she's also used actigraphy um, in both um, parent or caregiver and the child. Dr. Feely has had um, funding from the American Nurses Foundation, along with funding from the University of Pittsburgh School of Nursing um, CRE pilot funding. So Dr. Feely um, is in the process of submitting a um, research grant to the National Institutes of Health that would look at self-monitoring sleep and psychosocial outcomes in the dyad of ch uh, child with type one diabetes and their parent. So for this study, she would be comparing methods of glucose monitoring, so continuous glucose monitoring versus self-blood glucose monitoring with sleep, psych psych uh, psychosocial outcomes like stress, um, depressive symptoms and anxiety, and the child's um, glycemic control. So the hope would be that data from this project would be able to help guide clinical recommendations and diabetes education to improve sleep and self-management in both parents and children uh, with um, type 1 diabetes. So Dr. Feely has had um, been very collaborative um, also and had um, multiple hub members as co-authors on her publications. So um, to highlight some key findings from Dr. Feely's work, she's shown that parent and child sleep is highly correlated. And she's shown this using both the subjective questionnaires that I had highlighted previously, along with actigraphy. Um, so she's basically shown that children who sleep poorly have parents who also sleep poorly. And some of you may be able to re relate to that. Um, she's also shown that um, sleep is a significant predictor of quality of life, stress, and depressive symptoms in caregivers in children with a chronic illness, which suggests that, again, this may be an important area for um, interventions. I also want to um, highlight um, work from Dr. Lynn Baniak. So Dr. Baniak um, had done a postdoctoral fellowship in the School of Nursing um, and joined the um, 
and then actually um, transitioned to the, the um, VA here at Pittsburgh to become the Associate Chief Nurse for Research. She still is adjunct faculty um, in the Department of Health and Community Systems here at the School of Nursing. Uh, um, so Dr. Baniak attends all of our sleep hub meetings and is an active participant, even though she um, is primarily um, working at the Pittsburgh VA. So Dr. Baniak's research interests include the impact of sleep disorders on self-management of chronic disease, along with effect of treatment of sleep apnea in older adults on quality of life, functional status, and frailty management. And she's also interested in obstructive sleep apnea and surgical risk among veterans. As you can see, Dr. Baniak has used multiple subjective assessments of sleep in her work, most of which you've seen previously in others work, and she's also used actigraphy and in-home sleep apnea testing as objective assessments. Dr. Baniak has had funding um, from the VA, um, what is called their SPIRE program, or Small Projects and Rehabilitation Research. She's also had funding from the American Nurses Foundation, and also um, uh, has received an NIH loan repayment plan um, from the National Institutes of Nursing Research. Dr. Baniak's um, current project is that is um, funded by that SPIRE project at the VA. Um, the project is entitled The Effect of Preoperative Obstructive Sleep Apnea Therapy on Surgical Outcomes. So she is using um, medical records data um, from the VA um, to do a retrospective case control analysis um, to determine the impact of preoperative um, positive airway pressure therapy for sleep apnea um, to see if that would mitigate postoperative complications. She also will be doing some qualitative interviews with patients to help guide the development of a perioperative protocol to optimize obstructive sleep apnea management among surgical patients. As you can see, Dr. Baniak um, has had multiple publications um, with other um, sleep hub members. As I said, she, although she is not housed in the School of Nursing, she is still very much involved in the um, sleep hub. So um, I wanted to highlight some key findings from Dr. Baniak's work. Um, she has found that in heart failure patients with preserved ejection fraction, that poor sleep, a, a, assessed both objectively and subjectively, and obstructive sleep apnea are highly prevalent, and that poor sleep is associated with functional impairment. She also, in this particular pop population, did not find that they um, have excessive daytime sleepiness, although we know that um, heart, many patients with heart failure um, are um, excessively sleepy during the day. It's also found that long sleep duration was associated with increased odds of being characterized as frail, but not pre-frail. Um, and so sleep duration um, may be a potential modifiable therapeutic target for frailty management. And then finally, um, she's also shown that following revascularization in patients with coronary artery disease, that perceived sleep-related functional impairment may be more reflective of persistent excessive daytime sleepiness um, independent of obstructive sleep apnea. She's also shown that uh, CPAP use improved sleep-related functional impairment in um, patients with coronary artery, artery disease and obstructive sleep apnea uh, who have excessive daytime sleepiness, even though adherence to CPAP was suboptimal. So I want to end um, our uh, highlights of faculty uh, mem sleep hub members by talking about um, Dr. Willow Doswell, who is an associate professor in the Department of Health Promotion and Development. Dr. Doswell is our um, Sleep Hub Pilot Award recipient. Um, so Dr. Doswell is interested in the relationship between sleep and social media in tween African-American girls 
And she's also interested in the role of self-advocacy and lifestyle, including sleep, in maternal morbidity and mortality risk in pregnant African-American women. So Dr. Doswell has used multiple subjective assessments of sleep, um, as you would expect, primarily um, uh, assessments that are geared towards um, children. And she's also used actigraphy in her um, tween girl sample. So as I said, Dr. Doswell was the recipient of our Sleep Hub pilot grant. Um, the title was Sleep uh, Correlates of Social Media Type and Use in Tween African-American Girls. So Dr. Doswell just, oops, sorry, just um, finished up her data collection for this project and is in the process of analyzing that data. So we're very much looking forward to um, learning what Dr. Doswell found in her study. So I wanted to highlight some other Sleep Hub members. Um, we have a couple of new faculty members who have very recently joined our Sleep Hub, um, including Jacob Kariuki, who is an assistant professor in health and community systems. Um, he is interested in incorporating sleep and in his work looking at um, cardiovascular risk in um, African-Americans. And we also um, have recently welcomed Dr. Paul Scott, who is the assistant professor in the health and community systems department also. And he is basically our statistician. Um, he has begun working with um, many of us to help um, do uh, analyze our data for our grants and also our publications. So we are very fortunate to have Dr. Scott with us. We also have um, several uh, PhD students who are working with um, some of us, faculty members. We have Bowman Join, uh, Stacy Orbell, and Jejan uh, Shi. And then finally, we also have a um, School of Nursing Undergraduate Research Mentoring Program student, um, Long Tran, who is working with Dr. Chasens. And we interestingly also have a couple of external members, external meaning they're not um, within the School of Nursing, um, who are active members of our Sleep Hub. We have Cassandra Godzik, who um, is a uh, T32 um, NIMH um, postdoc at Dartmouth College Medical Center. Um, she actually had worked with um, Kathy Bender, who is an assistant or who is a full professor in the Health and Community Systems Department here in the School of Nursing. And given her research interest, she um, kind of referred Cassie to our Sleep Hub. So she has um, become an active member. We also have um, Anne Johansson, who is another external member. Um, Anne was actually a former uh, school of nursing DNP student who um, uh, somewhat recently um, graduated with her DNP. And she is now currently a clinical researcher in the de um, Department of Medical Genetics um, here at the, school, or, um, at the University of Pittsburgh. So I finally uh, just wanna end on our sort of goals um, as we move forward with the Sleep Hub. We wanna to continue to support tr uh, trainees and faculty supporting grants and disseminating research findings. Uh, we have bi-monthly meetings um, where individuals can um, bring their specific aims for their grants, um, bring um, abstracts for presentations that they plan to submit to conferences, um, drafts of manuscripts to get feedback. And so it's a very supportive um, and collaborative um, environment um, within the Sleep Hub. We also want to continue to collaborate on manuscripts. As you can see, we've all already been very um, productive in, in um, producing multiple manuscripts with, um, um, set with multiple um, Sleep Hub members as co-authors. We also would like to raise the awareness of the Sleep Hub, both within and outside of the School of Nursing. We're always looking for folks who may have some interest in including sleep in their research. Um, we, we would love for them to um, join us and, and um, you know, become involved. 
We also are interested in identifying internal and external speakers who can present on sleep topics relevant to nurses. So we um, hope to be able to identify and have um, uh, some speakers um, here in the future. We had had um, uh, Dr. Um, Amy Sawyer from the University of Pennsylvania scheduled um, this prior April to come and do a, um, a couple uh, days here at the school. Uh, school of nursing, give a talk, meet with students, so on and so forth. However, COVID kind of shut that down, so that unfortunately had to be canceled. Um, but we hope to um, revive that um, once things uh, loosen up and, and um, individuals are able to travel more freely. And then finally, we also want to explore opportunities to provide sleep education out in the Pittsburgh community. So I'm going to end there. Um, thank you very much for your attention and I am happy to answer any questions that you may have. This dog is so cute. <laughs> That's like how I feel like every day when I wake up, I'm like, just like five more minutes. <laughs> right. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. This has been so fascinating. There are a few questions, so I'll um, uh, quickly answer the, um, have you answer them. Um, so you talked, um, you mentioned a few um, students that are involved um, within the um, sleep hubs. How are they, are they doing like research? Are they like part of your, um, are they actually the ones doing the sleeping and then you guys talk to them? How are they, how are they being used? Sure, sure. So um, they, um, so um, Bowman just um, is just um, recently defended her um, doctoral um, study proposal, which is looking at um, the association between obstructive sleep ap co comorbid uh, obstructive sleep apnea and insomnia and its effect on um, depression. So her um, dissertation project will involve sleep. Um, we, uh, Stacy Orbel, just, um, she is, um, um, I will be her mentor and she just started the PhD program this term. So she's um, just getting her feet wet at this point, um, but she is, um, working on a, um, a uh, integrative review looking at, um, as Dr. Baniak's interest um, has been in, uh, looking at the management of structure sleep apnea in the perioperative period. And then we have Zhejiang Shi, who has been um, a graduate research um, assistant on my R01 study, um, and has also helped um, provide statistical support for many of the publications that I shared with you. So the awesome. students, students are involved in our research, but they're also doing their own research as part of their programs. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. That sounds great. And it's like, it sounds like the hubs, professors and researchers are like mentoring the students, which is amazing. Yes. That's great. Um, have you guys done any, I mean, I know that it's still new. Um, I know that my sleep schedule has been a little out of whack <laughs> since COVID. Um, are you guys going to be focusing on that at all within the hubs? Um, are people sleeping more, are people sleeping less, like their stress levels? Um, is that a potential for further research within the hubs? I think that's certainly a very interesting area right now. Um, I, I don't know that anyone is specifically um, studying that currently. Um, however, you know, we know that that is, you know, this kind of um, unprecedented time is, is affecting individuals in many ways. And we're, we have also had discussions recently about um, providing some um, tips and strategies um, surrounding sleep to our faculty and staff members within the School of Nursing. Um, I am um, a member of the School of Nursing um, Faculty and Staff Welfare Committee. And so the hub has um, uh, discussed having um, a partnership with that committee to, like I said, provide 
a, um, a session on helping um, to improve sleep. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Um, so how does the, um, this specific hub fund its research? Um, are there specific areas of need within the program? Um, yeah, that's, yeah. <laughs> sure. um, so the, the um, funds specifically for the hub um, has come from the School of Nursing. Um, so we, like we have used those funds, um, as I said, for the pilots um, award that we, we gave out. We've also used it um, to uh, purchase some equipment like the Acti watches that I said, so that, um, that we have, um, you know, those to loan out to um, individuals within the school of nursing who may be um, wanting to you know, objectively assess sleep in their research. Um, you know, those devices are quite expensive. And if you don't, if you're wanting to collect some pilot data, you may not necessarily have the funds to purchase those yourself. So the hub um, has those there available for researchers um, to use for that purpose. Um, <clears throat> we've also um, funded um, speakers too. Um, to come and um, give presentations um, and giving honorariums and, and travel um, reimbursements like that. Um, as for the faculty members funding their own personal research, you can see that we have explored um, many um, options for um, obtaining funding for our research, both um, at, you know, sort of the um, national level through National Institutes of Health, down to, um, you know, these smaller foundations like the American Nurses Foundation, and even more specifically within the university and um, the School of Nursing. So we're always looking out for um, available funds we can apply for to help um, support our research. Yeah, absolutely. Has COVID at all like affected your like the slowdown of research? Has it affected the like funding opportunities? Um, I know COVID's messed up a lot of things. So right. I'm just right. to know if it has affected your um, your research at all. Yeah. Um, so uh, yes. Um, so <laughs> when um, things kind of shut down back in March, the university. Um, put out some guidelines for what research can continue and what needs to be um, paused, essentially, um, until things get more resolved. Um, and again, it depended on what activities <clears throat> um, you were doing with participants and were they at risk populations. Um, so my uh, R01 study had to be stopped um, at that time because you know we're we were enrolling adults with asthma which is one of the high risk populations along with requiring them to come to the asthma institute um, in oakland um, to do some in-person assessments which at that time was not um, permitted hence has now opened up and, and those can occur. So I, I will be restarting my research here, hopefully in the next week or so. Um, but I've had to transition um, more of my assessments to an online format. Um, we had had individuals um, filling out questionnaires and things when they came for their in-person assessments, but um, to try to alleviate you know, that fear that may come with having to come to, um, you know, a health care facility for your research visit, we transition a lot of those um, questionnaires and things to online. So yes, it has affected not just myself, but other researchers um, in the School of Nursing and across um, the university. Yeah, as it all, I mean, it, yeah, that's the way it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
Okay, well, I want to be conscientious of your time and our attendees. So thank you um, again. This has been an amazing start to our um, Hubs presentation series and a wonderful um, continuation of our stay at homecoming virtual programming. Um, if anyone has any further questions, would I be able to share your um, email address out to them? Absolutely, yes. Awesome, wonderful. So thank you again, Dr. Lester, and thank you to all of our wonderful attendees. Um, as always, if you need anything from me, please feel free to reach out and have a wonderful rest of your day and hail to Pitt. Thank you. Thank you so much.